sometime in the next few decades, humans will leave this planet to live in another world. That means that some people in our life can be the first Martians. How about that? We're finding out a lot about how to explore Mars in our station. Over a thousand people from over 40 countries have actually participated in one crew or another. It's the grandest adventure I could possibly imagine. That is, for me, the most important reason why we should pursue the establishment of life on Mars. If we go to Mars in our time, 200 years from now, there'll be new branches of human civilization on Mars. And we are live. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to the inaugural episode of Red Planet Live. I'm your host, Ron Craig, and I am here to talk to the one and only Dr. Robert Zubrin. So I'm going to bring him on the stream. Uh, just give me one second. Hey, Dr. Zubrin, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Thanks for inviting me on the show again. Well, you know, it's, uh, you know, the way I look at it that, you know, if we're going to do the first episode of the show, uh, you know, and kind of think about, you know, who are you going to invite? Well, how about the actual president of the same place that's actually producing the show? So I thought, hey, perfect fit, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, so uh, I definitely want to thank you for coming. So really, the, the, uh, the idea and the purpose of the show is really kind of an off the off the cuff look at all things Mars, you know, we want to talk about STEM you know, industry experts, planetary scientists, space advocates, enthusiasts, and of course, that is you in a nutshell. So kind of how I wanted to start out the show, because uh, I think it's always uh, important to kind of know what, you know, gets people ticking in terms of, you know, why you fell in love with space. So I actually wanted to kind of start out my questions with you uh, before we start getting into the audience questions that we polled, uh, you know, over the time, is really what you know, led you, let's say kind of lit your spark in terms of, you know, why you fell in love with space and Mars, you know, in the first place, uh, you know, thinking back, you know, the kind of what drove that for you? Well, um, it was Sputnik. Okay. Um, I was uh, five when Sputnik flew and I was already reading science fiction. I was an early reader. And um, while to the adult world, the Sputnik may have been terrifying because it meant the Soviets could hit us. To me as a child, it was just marvelous. It was exhilarating. It was great. Because what it meant to me, um, and this was an accurate perception, was that the stories I was reading about the space-faring future were going to be real. And I wanted to be part of it. Oh, that's amazing. You know, it's, uh, can you actually think back to a time and like, if I look back at my own self, you know, and, and if, if I look way back, you know, I've been around the sun a few times and, uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, why I fell in love with space. I actually remember still sitting in the library when I actually went and grabbed a book off the shelf and it was actually Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot. And that for me is really where I kind of get in and said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, to see all the, you know, especially because it was the hardcover with the full, full pictures and the ground, you know, everything was just so visual and just amazing. And the fact that, you know, you see galaxies and dot, you know, every dot I used to look up and, you know, I always used to stare up in the sky and look at the stars. And, and that, that for me was really uh, kind of my breaking into, you know, my passion moment for me. And uh, so for you, I mean, how, how would you phrase it in terms of like your inspirations of who you look at? Uh, that's kind of given you, you know, your inspiration. Well, as I say, in terms of world events, it was Sputnik and then the Apollo program. And in terms of writers, I would say uh, first and foremost, Arthur Clarke. Uh, and then also uh, Heinlein. Um, and uh, to a an certain extent, Edgar Rice Burroughs, actually. Um, even though he was uh, much further from uh, any realistic view of Mars, he nevertheless, you know, by painting this picture of this, this many faceted civilization on Mars, all these marvelous things, uh, what he conveyed, e even though the details were all false, uh, was a deeper truth, which is that there are other worlds. Okay. <laughs> there are other worlds. And you know, there's an inhabited Mars. 
in the imagination, which means there is one that could be. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think that's quite the Mars we want to create, but nevertheless, it just showed that there's just so much more out there waiting to be discovered, waiting to be encountered than what we see here. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And, and the fact is, is that we have the means and the capability of doing that today. You know, it's not almost, you know, I mean, I look at, uh, I, don't know, I think we all love sci-fi. I mean, even if I look at a question for, you know, my love of sci-fi, I think I've made it well known throughout my my career is my, you know, I'm a lover of Star Trek, you know, Gene Roddenberry and what he did. And, you know, and and to me, uh, you know, to look up and, and see that vision of going to other worlds and other planets. Now, obviously, they're doing a little bit quicker than we can do today. But, you know, I look at that as, you know, a stretch of the imagination. And, you know, I, I it's amazing what we've done, you know, in terms of science fiction becoming science fact. You know, and I, I think that I even think back to Back to the Future, those movies, you know, the things that actually were there and people thought up in Hollywood, you know, we can actually see a lot of those uh, devices in use today because it almost seems like if we, if we think it, if we dream it, we can make it happen. And I think, you know, and, and I think the fact that we have so many robotics on Mars is, is a really clear sign that we really are capable of doing just incredible things. Yeah. Well, you know. The, the iPhone is basically a, a combination of the Star Trek communicator and tricorder. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, With a uh, clock maybe... and a camera thrown in. Awesome. <laughs> oh, I, I agree. I love it. So, so yeah, so what I was going to do, so, so we have a couple guests that I actually wanted to invite on the show uh, because, you know, what I did is we put a poll out and we put some posts out through uh, uh, all the channels and a lot of great uh, questions and feedback came in from a, from a lot of people. So, so, uh, so I wanted to actually bring on a couple that actually have some questions for you live, if that's okay with you, uh, just to kind of, you know, get the ball rolling and, you know, see what people are doing and, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, you have a lot of fans out there, <laughs> you have a lot of people that have, a, you know, a lot of respect for what you do and, and what you mean to the industry and, you know, what you're doing from ours. So, so I think, you know, so what I want to do is I want to bring on somebody who not only does he have a question, but I think, you know, I really want to kind of put the spotlight a bit on him. So I'm going to bring on Ryan Kennedy. And uh, so Ryan's in the feed here. And so I'd like to introduce him because, you know, the Mars Society is a big operation. You know, it's, you know, you have a lot of social groups, a lot of things going on. And one thing that uh, really stands out for me as I used to navigate the scene is going to the groups. There was obviously we needed admins and we need moderators uh, to make, you know, everything run smoothly. Well, one of the best moderators that I see out there on any group is sitting right here with us, Ryan Kennedy. He works tirelessly. I can't believe how much work he does in the Mars Society group. So I want, I thought... You know, who better to actually bring on is, uh, you know, to ask the first question of you is somebody who really tirelessly works for, you know, the Mars Society to help out as a volunteer. So, Ryan, uh, you know, I know you had a question for uh, for Dr. Zubrin. So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to kind of just go and bring that up here. Uh, so your, your question here that you wanted to bring up for Dr. Zubrin here uh, on the screen here. So do you think about the exhaust plume hole that was dug out? Now, I think what you're getting at here is, you know, what we need to do in regards to, obviously that caused an issue and there could even be some sort of collapse coming because of the actual exhaust. So, uh, but yeah, go ahead and ask your question there and I'll let you actually. Um, what do you think about the exhaust plume hole that was dug out by the ground, by the, sorry. I'm trying to read off the screen. Oh, it's okay. Um, so I've heard you talk before about the exhaust plume hole causing the hole in the ground underneath Starship to make Starship topple into it. And is this just reaffirming what you were saying or does well do you think uh, the upper thrusters on the HLS Starship for the Lunar Lander would work to prevent this from happening? Well, it shows that there's an issue for sure. Um, now, um, there, there's uh, potentially ways to resolve it. Uh, one that the SpaceX has proposed itself is to have auxiliary landing thrusters at the top of the Starship. Uh, this was um, central to their proposal of using the Starship as a lunar lander. And that might work. Um, I think uh, an alternative uh, would be, um, I, I believe that 
SpaceX should also develop a mini starship, um, about one fifth the size, something sized about right to be the upper stage of a, of, of a Falcon 9. So they'd have a lot of commercial use for it as a fully reusable medium lift vehicle, but it could also be sent to Mars um, with uh, smaller crews and they could prepare landing pads for the big starship. Um, and uh, so that that's another way to go. Um, and then finally, I mean, it could be that places on Mars are found uh, that have, uh, uh, you know, suitable surfaces uh, that aren't just unconsolidated unconsolidated dirt, but, you know, maybe a plane of basalt and do your first landing there and then I'll go out and build additional landing pads in other places. So there's a number of ways to do it, but certainly it's, it's an issue uh, that needs to be addressed. Yes. Um, if they landed on a pad of basalt, do you think that would make it harder for them to find water or do you think there's localized basalt outcrops that they would be landing on? Well, they, they would land on uh, the basalt, and then they, uh, and presumably this place would be near uh, locations where glaciers were available. Uh, you know, but um, that would be the idea. Cool. Okay, Ryan. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you stopping by. And again, I want to really thank you for all the work that you do in, you know, the Mars Society groups and, you know, really, really appreciative because, you know, things don't really work well unless everybody is, you know, putting in, you know, a, a lot of effort and you put in a thousand percent effort. So I really want to appreciate and thank you. And uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to take you and we'll, we'll go on to the next guest. So yeah, so the next guest that I wanted to bring on to actually uh, ask you a question as well is somebody that uh, I've come to know really well in the industry uh, is, is Matthew Williams. So he's actually a space journalist. He writes for, you know, a uh, number of publications. So I'll just actually bring him on because he said he wanted, he had a couple of questions for you. So I'm going to give him a chance. So uh, Matt, if you are there, you seem to have your camera off. So if you want to introduce yourself and uh, go ahead, take it away and, uh, and, and ask a question. Okay. Thank you. And um, thank you, Dr. Zerber. Um, we've actually uh, chatted uh, limited correspondence in, in the past there. Um, I want to ask you about, in, in your book, The Case for Mars, you made a compelling case for a Mars direct mission and the mission architecture involved there. Um, so I've been wanting to get your thoughts on NASA's current mission architecture, or at least what's been espoused in terms of the whole moon to Mars, journey to Mars, uh, uh, the, that kind of proposal there. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't think that NASA actually has a current mission architecture for Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the kinds of things they've been showing on their charts are not to be taken seriously at all. They're just trying illustrations mm -hmm. where they're trying to say, well, you know, the lunar orbiting gateway could be used for this. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were to actually take it seriously, you would um, um, need to do some psychiatry. The, 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 mm -hmm. the, um, that is, a, it's a crazy mission plan. It makes no sense whatsoever. That is, they have come up with this thing called a deep space transport, which would be based mm -hmm. on the lunar orbiting gateway. And this would use electric propulsion to depart mm -hmm. the gateway to go to Mars. And it would actually take 300 days to go from the gateway to Mars, which is almost twice as long as we can currently do using chemical propulsion, leaving low Earth orbit. Um, it, it has no purpose whatsoever, except um, it's kind of like rewriting a, a, a play in order to give all the children in the school play a part. So to come up with a Mars mission plan that gives a role for the gateway and gives a role for electric propulsion when neither have any useful role in a Mars mission. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I don't think this is gonna happen. Um, they're, they're not, I mean, yes, they're building the gateway, but not for this purpose. They're building the gateway in order to have a place for Orion to fly to. And mm -hmm. they've, they've distorted the lunar architecture on that basis of insisting mm -hmm. that it was the gateway. Do you know, okay, they approved uh, Starship as the human landing system. And, and by the way, I, yeah. I uh, agree with that decision given mm -hmm. the choices that they had. Um, but the, it requires accepting a totally new concept of operations of 
uh, rapid launches of reusable launch vehicles instead of infrequent launches of expendable launch vehicles. And because uh, the Starship operating between lunar orbit and the lunar surface, get this, if it operates between the gateway and the lunar surface, it will take 14 tanker flights, 14 tanker mm. flights to refuel it. That is, there would be two tankers that would actually go to the gateway and um, uh, 12 other tankers, six for each of the two tankers that would be used to fuel them to go to the gateway to fuel the Starship lander. So that's 14. But guess what? If you didn't have a gateway and you were basing the Starship in low lunar orbit, the Apollo orbit, it would only take 10. So the, that, that is by having the gateway and imposing it on the mission that they make the mission 40% more difficult. Um, now, uh, but the, the uh, you know, the Musk Starship architecture for going to Mars, which is the purpose for which Starship was received, uh, yes. does not use the lunar orbit gateway, does not use a mm -hmm. propulsion, does not use Orion, uh, does not use any of those things. Um, it launches a Starship into low Earth orbit and then it refuels it there. Uh, mm -hmm. It would need to refuel it with about five other starships, not 10, not 14, five, mm -hmm. uh, to go directly to Mars from low Earth orbit and land on Mars. And then you would make the return propellant on Mars from carbon dioxide and, hot, and uh, uh, water um, uh, for the direct return from Earth. So there's no gateway stations. There's none of this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. The amount of orbital refueling you have <coughs> is actually much less than for these uh, lunar missions. Um, and certainly, I mean, this deep space transport, it doesn't even address the central question, which is going to Mars. W what it is, it's a, a design for a fancy spaceship that basically will set a new altitude record for the Aviation Almanac by flying near Mars. Uh, and they say, well, you know, the reason why we're looking at this stuff is because we don't have a system that can land... 10 tons or more on Mars uh, and so you can't do human Mars missions. Well, if, if the problem that you have is that you can't land, you don't have a lander, a heavy Mars lander, then the way you resolve that is not by building lunar orbiting space stations. It's by developing a heavy Mars lander. Now, if Starship is successful, that will give you a very heavy Mars lander, 100 ton power. Um, but I, actually, I think that it would be legitimate, very legitimate for NASA at this point, given that Starship success is not certain at this point, um, to initiate a program to develop a heavy Mars. Um, mm -hmm. because that's the central piece of hardware they need to initiate human Mars missions. And they could use the heavy Mars lander. You could launch it with SLS. You could launch it with Falcon Heavy uh, to deliver first robotic missions to Mars, but not a single rovers like Perseverance, but platoons of rovers. Land 30 at a time of different types for different purposes, including, yes, Perseverance style rovers, but also uh, helicopters, not little helicopters, but significant size mm -hmm. ones to do real exploration, uh, as well as construction rovers to start building the Mars base. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, uh, Matt, for that. I mean, that was awesome. Was a fantastic question. That uh, definitely uh, mm -hmm. got into some good stuff there. So, so yeah, so, so, so we're going to move on. Uh, so we, so we got Jane actually coming up. So I really want to appreciate it. Thank you very much, Matt. And we will, yeah. uh, we, we will get you on the next one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, that was awesome. Actually, I really loved uh, that explanation. You know, and it really comes down to economics too. You know, if you know, as a taking you know fourteen as opposed to ten as opposed to five, <laughs> you know, I mean, it really, you know, that really hits the bottom line as well. So I mean, because really, it, it really comes down to cost and money uh, at that point. So, so what I want to bring on too. So actually, the next person that I'm going to bring on is I'm going to bring on Shana here, and so Shana is actually was just at MDRS. So the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. So she's actually from Crew 245. So she wanted to stop by and she had a question for you. And uh, your camera went all liney on you, but... Uh, <laughs> can you hear me all right now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. 
All right. As long as audio is there, I suppose we can survive. Uh, yes. And that was a super interesting discussion to catch the tail end of. Uh, I had a question as well, obviously, about moving forward. Uh, when I read your book, The Case for Space, you had an amazing little discussion at the end that talked about the difference between human and robotic missions, primarily being that robotic missions have always been mission driven and that human missions have traditionally been constituency driven, which has led to the fact that they haven't perhaps had the power or duration behind them uh, for continuity over time. And obviously human missions to Mars are near and dear to my heart. And I was wondering since that book came out, what your thoughts have been on the development of the Artemis program and how we managed to define our human missions and our need for them. Okay, well, okay. Now, uh, Apollo was uh, purpose-driven purpose mm -hmm. was not scientific, but it certainly had a purpose. The purpose was to astonish the world of what free people can do. And, and it did exactly that. Uh, but after that, without a defined purpose for the human space flight program, uh, it became, yes, a vendor-driven program, while the science programs have remained uh, purpose-driven. And this includes both the robotic planetary exploration programs and the space astronomy programs. Okay, you know, we didn't send spirit and opportunity uh, to Mars in order to give business to the uh, big rover, uh, excuse me, the airbag consortium. Um, the uh, big airbag did not drive that mission. The mission was done to explore Mars with rovers, and then they chose the technologies they would use uh, on rational criteria within that context. Now, uh, the Artemis program, okay, well, I'll give Artemis... Um, I don't know, one cheer, maybe at this point, even one and a half cheers um, in that, okay, the Trump administration did realize that if you're going to have a human space program, it ought to have some objectives. <laughs> and this is important uh, to actually have an objective, uh, to not just be flying people in space in order to fly people in space, which, I mean, frankly, there's an you know, the shuttle program, there's a few shuttle missions that had a real purpose, the Hubble launch and repair, those were great. But uh, most of the shuttle missions, including, for instance, the Columbia accident, they, they were flying astronauts in order to fly the shuttle, period. Um, you know, that that's what they were doing. It, it didn't have meaningful payloads. Um, now, Artemis, okay, so the Trump people said, we're going to give NASA's human space flight program an objective, okay? And uh, the objective is going to be the moon, okay? Because they had encountered so much resistance within NASA to the idea of actually taking on Mars. Uh, you know, Obama had this thing with a journey to Mars, but the dates for it were so vague and future. Risk, they did not command activity in the present, which means it wasn't a real goal. It was something. It was a dream, not a goal. Uh, now they wanted to Trump people. Yes, they said, okay, it's going to be a goal. And we're going to land people on the moon by 2024, which indeed, if you took that seriously uh, at the time this was promulgated, which was around 2018 or so, um, you could do it, but you'd have to take it seriously. But they didn't. In other words, they, 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 they talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk. Okay. If you in 2018 wanted to land people on the moon by 2024, you have to get diversionary projects out of the way, such as, for instance, the Deep Space Gateway, which was conceived of by the Obama administration. It should be remembered as an alternative to going to the moon. Uh, Administrator Bolton said, we will never return to the moon. Uh, but they wanted to have something to do. And when this idea of putting an asteroid in lunar orbit proved unfeasible, they said, well, we'll put a space station in lunar orbit. We can go visit it. Okay, which like, whatever, uh, it, it has no real purpose, but it's something to do. Now, uh, but the Trump administration, if they had been serious about getting to the moon in six years uh, or so, seven years, whatever, uh, would have said, sorry, no time for that. Just as during Apollo, there were all sorts of people. Whenever you have a program like this, there's always going to be people that pop up and say, you, you have a great idea, but you can't do your program until you do my program. Okay. And, and we, we had this in Apollo. There were people who said, 
yeah, go to the moon, but you can't do it until you have a space station, or you can't do it until you have nuclear rockets, or you can't do it until you have a Saturn 9, and, and all this stuff. And these people were pushed out of the room because Kennedy was serious. Okay, and he made it clear to NASA that he was serious. We're going to the moon by the end of the decade. And we're not going to do everyone else's favorite project before we do mine. Uh, and, and that's how we got to the moon, because the schedule was serious. Now, the Artemis schedule was not serious. Um, you know, it, it could have been serious, but it wasn't. Okay. So rather than, um, you know, uh, Trump's problem <laughs> it was that he wasn't willing to be annoying enough. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 that is, he wasn't willing to 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 say, look, uh, yeah, uh, forget it, uh, we're not doing that. Cancel those contracts. We're focused here, we're going to the moon. You know, if you you know, it's my way or the highway. Get out of the room. No, he wasn't willing to do it. He said, well, we'll go to the moon, and yeah, we can do this other stuff too, and whatever. And so. Um, it, it became a, a very confused lunar architecture. Now, so then what they did was, if you actually, they were also committed to these legacy systems, including SLS and Orion. And not only that, they were using SLS with a degraded design, without a proper upper stage. Uh, and with the weak upper stage that they put on SLS, uh, and the greatly overweight Orion. Orion weighs 26 tons. The Apollo capsule weighed eight tons. Uh, the, the, uh, Orion is so heavy and SLS is so weak that SLS cannot deliver Orion into low lunar orbit with enough propellant for it to come home, let alone deliver it into low lunar orbit with a lunar excursion module and enough propellant to come home, which is what a Saturn V could do, okay? Because the Apollo capsule was lighter and the Saturn V was stronger. Uh, the, so instead they said, well, we'll just use it to go to the gateway because the SLS can get Orion to the gateway, which is in a high lunar orbit. And then we'll have to get a, uh, lunar excursion vehicle to the gateway with other launchers. And, uh, because for some reason, and I don't really understand this, uh, it's projected that SLS can only fly once per year, which is frankly, a scandal uh, because, you know, the shuttle averaged four launches a year. Its record was about eight launches per year, but it averaged four. And the, sh you know, SLS is just the shuttle without the orbiter. That's all it is. Okay. The, I was actually on the team that did the preliminary design of what is now called SLS in 1988. 1988. That's, 33 years ago. That's longer ago than most of the people working on the SLS program have been alive. Okay, the, 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 the preliminary design was done. And we did not think that there was anything wonderful or marvelous or revolutionary about that vehicle, which we called the Aries. Uh, it was just that this was the quickest and dirtiest way to make a, a heavy lift launch vehicle. Take the shuttle parts that we have flying right now, put them together, lose the orbiter, and you're, you're there. And this was turned into a, a 30 year banquet uh, to fill out people's time cards. And it's been so extended that uh, unfortunately, the, you know, in 1988, the same people who were, who had developed the shuttle in the 1970s were still very much around in NASA. Uh, and they would have been available to develop the SLS in the early nineties. And they would have known exactly what they were doing and it would have been straightforward. But by delaying it an extra several decades, those people all retired and the development was left to people who had never developed a, a launch vehicle. Uh, and, and anyway, uh, so, but, but here's the scandal. They said the SLS can only fly once per year, even though the shuttle, which was more complicated, could do four. So if the SLS can only fly once a year, the lunar excursion vehicle has to be delivered by something else. Well, what else? Well, okay, we've got medium lift launch vehicles. They can't deliver a whole lunar excursion vehicle to the gateway all at once. But if we have three of them, they can deliver it in three separate pieces, which could be assembled at the gateway. So now you've got four launches per mission, 
all of which have to work. If one fails, the whole mission fails, okay? Because each are carrying unique parts. Okay, so now you've multiplied the risk of the mission fourfold, okay? You've got four rendezvous to do on the outbound leg, as well as a, a rendezvous to do on the return leg. So there's five rendezvous. There's, uh, let's see, there's the gateway, there's the Orion, there's the three things. Uh, so there's five flight elements. The, the risk in the, uh, of this is operationally insane. And the, the, but this is what was proposed. You can see it on NASA's charts. Um, and this is what uh, the Blue Origin uh, na led national team proposed in their human landing system. They, they looked at this, they said, okay, we're gonna propose that. This is how this fits in with that plan. And miraculously, and everyone was expecting them to win because they were playing exactly to the customer's prejudices or apparent prejudices. And miraculously, NASA chose the SpaceX instead. And it opens up totally different sets of possibilities. It involves its own set of, of, of uh, technical risks. Uh, but if those risks can be overcome, you don't get a, a single small lunar mission launched at most once a year at, uh, uh, you get lunar missions with heavy capability that can be launched uh, uh, several times a year. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Shana. Thank that you. was actually a very, that was, I appreciate it. Yeah, that was an awesome question. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate it. So I, I hope I answered you. If, if you if you want more details on this whole thing, I, I wrote an article that was published in Nautilus magazine about a month ago, where I, I go into the ins and outs of all of this. Okay, cool. So, I mean, one thing that, uh, so I wanted to actually just take a moment too, because one thing I wanted to make sure that we, uh, we had time is to mention your late, you know, your book, uh, that came out in, you know, it's about two years now that you've had it out. So one thing that I've actually, so a case for space. And, uh, so what I actually did is I made sure I put in the chat long ago, uh, but you can actually guys, you can pick this up on Amazon. So it's, uh, Dr. Zubrin's latest book. And so, that leads me into one of the other questions that I actually had for you is, is there anything else in the works that we could be looking forward to uh, that you actually might be writing that's coming out that you can, uh, a little sneak peek? <laughs> um, well, I'm working on a book about nuclear power. Ooh. Um, okay. And uh, both the fission and fusion and the possibilities they offer for humankind. And I have ideas for another book about Mars as well. But the one I'm working on currently is the nuclear book. Oh, yeah. So any, any uh, expected uh, publication date? No, not yet. The book's not finished yet. But okay, cool. No, it's still that's exciting. And it's, a, it's an exciting field as well, because, you know, nuclear propulsion is actually something that's been proposed for some time. And it's going to be interesting to see your thoughts in terms of, you know, the, uh, the FCC of, you know, actually that happening, you know, uh, making that actually worthwhile, usable, uh, and actually hopefully cost effective. And I think, you know, right. that's kind of leads me into another question that I was thinking uh, that I had as well is, you know, we see a lot of competition now uh, when it comes to the space, you know, it's almost like you know, we're back in the Apollo era and there's now a space race that's going on. Uh, and it's not so much against nation versus nation. It's now, you know, because of the private and the commercialization of space, it's now private versus public and company versus company. And I think that, you know, I'd like to see what your thoughts are of how does that actually help or hinder, you know, our goal to get to Mars? Yeah, I mean, I think competition it, at times can be very good. And I think, no, there's a lot of public and private competition that, it, you know, could drive competition down, increase innovation. That's my thoughts on it. But I'd like to hear your thoughts in terms of where is that heading? Well, this is uh, heading to Mars. Um, the, uh, yeah, I talk about this a lot in the case for space. Uh, the entrepreneurial space revolution and and its implications. Um, see, what Musk and company have done, the Musketeers, uh, is not just uh, developed a number of remarkable uh, space flight systems and in the process cut the cost of space launch by a factor of five in the past decade when it was stagnant like a law of nature, $10,000 a kilogram for 40 years. Now it's 2500 uh, a kilogram, and if Starship is successful, it'll be more like 500 a kilogram. Um, the, 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 uh, they've proven that, uh, a broader point, which is that it is possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team 
to do things that were previously thought that only the governments of major powers could do. And not only that, do them in one third of the time and one tenth the cost or less, and even do things that they uh, had deemed impossible altogether, period. Such as, for instance, reusable large vehicles that come back and land at the pad instead of just crashing into the ocean. Sometimes. Okay, now, as a result, okay, they have set off uh, an entrepreneurial space race, which includes both launch vehicles and spacecraft and various space technologies as well. And there's a lot of money going to that. And they've also, by the way, uh, set off an entrepreneurial race in other fields, uh, including nuclear power and nuclear fusion. Uh, fusion power, people had sort of given up hope on that. The government programs seem to never get anywhere. But uh, some investors looked at the success of SpaceX and they said, well, hey, look, maybe the problem with fusion wasn't, um, isn't fundamentally technical. Maybe it's like reusable space launch vehicles. Maybe it's institutional. And maybe it's the wrong kind of organizations that are doing it, okay? And now there are entrepreneurial fusion companies. One of them, TAA, uh, T-A-E, um, Tri Alpha Energy in California has got $800 million in investment. That's like twice as much as the US government's fusion uh, budget. Um, and there's others. In England, there's Tokamak Energy, which has uh, uh, gotten significant investment. And, is, it, and these guys are moving much faster than IDER, which is the official international fusion. Anyway, now in terms of space, getting back to this, um, why is Musk working on Starship? The Falcons are already a factor of five cheaper than any other launch vehicle. He is, is taking over practically the whole free world launch market. Um, and um, why is he developing a technology to make the Falcons obsolete? That's certainly not the way things have been done by aerospace in the past. But, you know, I happen to know that there's at least five companies in China, entrepreneurial companies that have gotten significant private investment who are working on reusable launch vehicles. And they look a lot like Falcon 9s, okay? And the um, and they're going to do it, okay? Because look, once somebody proves that something can be done, there's other smart people in the world who can exploit the exact same laws of physics, and they'll have no problem finding investors once someone else has proven that it's going to work, okay? So Musk knows that too. Musk knows that the Falcons are going to be king of the hill for maybe another three years, and then other people are going to have Falcons, okay? Yep. So he's got to have something better. And you know what? When he proves that Starship works, there'll be a bunch of companies elsewhere, in particular in China, who will start working on Starships too. And they will get money to do it. And they will do it. Okay? And the, the, the you know, Americans, okay, uh, Musk, while not born in America, is very American. Uh, the uh, He's more American than a very large number of Americans, but the the the, the uh, they're very good at inventing things. Okay, unique in certain ways in this respect. Uh, where four percent of the world's population in the past hundred years were responsible for about fifty percent of the world's inventions. But you know what? There, there's plenty of very competent engineers in the world who, once they see that something is possible, are fully capable of working it out. And that absolutely includes people in China. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, uh, so he's going to have to keep doing this. So when the Chinese create their own starship, he's going to have to create hyper starship. I mean, the, 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 there's no end to this. This is the creative principle. Uh, this is the competitive principle. And um, so things are going to get cheaper and cheaper. And the cheaper space launch gets the cheaper spacecraft are going to get, both because there'll be more space launches if they're cheaper at supply and demand, which means that there'll be um, spacecraft will be produced in greater numbers. Mass production brings down prices. But also the cheaper space launch becomes the less conservative spacecraft designers need to be. For the, the past half century, the wisdom among spacecraft designers has been don't use anything that hasn't been used before. Because if it's going to cost you $300 million to launch this satellite, 
you're not going to risk the whole satellite to save five million dollars on the battery or you know whatever um and and so this is a formula for stagnation only use things that are already flight proven but the cheaper space launch becomes the more risks people are going to be willing to take on new technologies that are potentially better, either lighter, less costly, more capable. So the spacecraft themselves are going to become more cost effective in every way, uh, which and cheaper launch, more capable, less costly spacecraft. You put that together, all sorts of business plans that people write about what they might do in space become a more and more favorable. And the, 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 you know, in other words, the, the, the numbers start to, to work out. And, and when the more business plans become feasible, the more space activities they're going to be. So you, you get qualitative expansion of the market. We're, we're opening up space big time. That's what this yeah. is going to do. Cool. So, so basically, it's almost like keeping up with the Musks. You know, <laughs> uh, so the Joneses are out. Now it's the Musks, and we're going to have to try to keep up with them. So, uh, you know, so, I mean, that, that that's amazing. I mean, competition. And, you know, I think that uh, there's so much hype around space now, and there's so much interest. And I think, you know, the communicators and everybody's doing a great job of getting visibility onto it. But, I mean, again, I mean, a lot of that still comes down to talk. And I think, you know, we, we need probably less talk and a lot more action. You know, I think, you know, we've had the capabilities to get to Mars for some time. And, you know, maybe not as quickly and maybe as efficiently or cost effectively as maybe some people would like, but we, it, we still have that capability. The fact is we've got robots that are on the planet, around the planet, and there's a whole bunch of them. We almost might, might even need a street light soon, actually, because there's so many, you know. So I think that, you know, getting there. So and it, when it comes to the human to Mars ambitions, to get humans on Mars, what do you see that's actually stopping us today? Uh, so, I mean, obviously we can't go today. We have to rent the Starship. But, you know, to get us to, to Mars in the near future, I don't know what that timeline looks like. I mean, I, I've seen so many different estimates, you know, people say in 2024, 2028, 2030, 2040, 2050, you know, I'm obviously want to see that happening sooner rather than later. But what to, so if we look at it from, what is your estimates of terms of when we're going to get to Mars? When can we get there based on how things are progressing today? And what's hindering or standing in the way to make that happen? Okay. Well, look, um, we could have been on Mars by the 1980s. NASA in the late 60s had plans to do it and had uh, the political class uh, remain committed to the venture, it would have happened. Um, but we've had a deterioration in the political class in this country, and I must say internationally. Um, you know, um, the people who got us to the moon were the same people or the younger brothers of the people that won World War II. Okay, quite literally. And, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy had been a torpedo boat commander in World War II. He understood that there were things that need to be done that involve risk and that there are things worth risking life for uh, to do. And so did, uh, you know, many members of the political class of that time, and they were able to work together to do great projects, whether it was World War II, the interstate highway systems, Adams for Peace, Apollo, they could do these things. Now the political class is uh, just incapable, uh, uh, you know, and whether you compare uh, Biden or Trump to Kennedy or FDR or or with Boris Johnson to Winston Churchill or Macron to Charles de Gaulle. I mean, uh, they're just not up to it. But because of, of this deterioration, um, the mechanism that many of us, including me, had hoped for to get us to Mars, uh, that is the U.S. government, um, basically did not do what it could have done. Uh, but precisely because they've dropped the ball, a new force has moved into the field. And this has been the entrepreneurial uh, uh, um, space people and including Musk and Bezos and many others. Okay. And, uh, you know, in the 1960s, no one would have looked for an entrepreneurial space savior because we didn't need one. NASA was storming heaven. Now you have this other force. Now, so this is re solving the problem that we've had uh, of an inadequate political class to take this on. 
Now, you asked, when do we get to Mars? I think by 2030. And I'll tell you how I think this is going to come down. Okay. Musk. Okay. Uh, not everything he says comes true uh, on the schedule that he projects. He tends to be very aggressive and optimistic in terms of what he can achieve in time. But he then eventually does achieve them. So they're saying they're going to get Starship to orbit. The last two years ago in 2019, they said they were going to get him to orbit in 2020. They did not. And now they're saying they're going to get him to orbit this year, which is possible, but I wouldn't bet on it. But I would bet on Starship reaching orbit by next year. Okay. And, um, and uh, I would bet with odds that it will certainly reach orbit by the year after next year. And really, at the end of the day, does it really matter whether it reaches orbit in 2020 or 2023 in the big picture? Um, the, the, it's going to reach orbit, and it's going. I think Starships will be operational delivering payloads to orbit by 2024. Now, we're going to have a presidential election in 2024. And if this is the reality that people are living in, that you've got fully reusable vehicles with Saturn V capability, but 1% of the cost because they're reusable, flying around, you know, getting to orbit once every couple of weeks, um, then then whoever's elected president is going to turn to his or her advisors and say, look, here's this character. He says he wants to get people to Mars and he's got these ships and look at this thing. They're flying around. Uh, can this be done if we got together with him? Could we get people to Mars before the end of my second term? And the answer is going to be absolutely yes. And uh, well, uh, but will it cost a trillion dollars? No, it could probably be done within NASA's existing budget. He's built the main thing. There's a bunch of other stuff that needs to be developed, but he hasn't built. We need Mars spaces. We need surface nuclear reactors, which would be a very hard thing for SpaceX to develop because it involves controlled materials. We need ISRU equipment. We need Mars rovers. We need all sorts of gear um, for which there is no commercial justification for developing, unlike Starship, which there is. Um, so we'll develop that part. And we'll meet this guy halfway. And yes, we'll be on Mars by 2030. And in other words, by making the mission feasible, by, by making it... See, look, when Kennedy committed us to the moon in 1961, you had to really have guts to say you were going to be on the moon by 1969. We hadn't even orbited anyone. We didn't know people could eat in space. The only thing we knew in 1961 was that we were American and America could do anything. That's what we knew. OK, um, and it was on that basis. People right now are not willing to to take that kind of chance. They don't have that kind of guts. But if it can be made easy, as it were, in other words, if it can be made clear that this is something that can be done, then they're willing to rise to it. And so um, that's when I think we'll get there. I will get to Mars by the end of the decade, and we're going to do it on the basis of a public private partnership. And I think. The role of the Mars Society here is going to make to, to make sure that the public part of that partnership comes to the table. Awesome. Awesome. Now, do you think that there's any risk right now? Because, you know, I think when everybody thinks about going to Mars, going to the moon, it's always like American first. You know, Americans always get there first. They always get there before everybody else. But, you know, with what's going on today with all the competition coming from, you know, China and the UAE and India and everybody kind of getting their hand in and getting getting a part of this and actually getting to Mars and actually having vehicles on Mars. Is there a risk or uh, right now? I don't want to call it risk. I mean, because I think, you know, I mean, obviously space is open. We want everybody to contribute and and be part of this mission. But is there a chance that there's going to be another nation that actually might beat the U.S. to Mars and actually have a human base there? I mean, I think even the moon is at risk right now. Well, look, in a race between an eagle and a bear or even between an eagle and a dragon, the eagle will win unless it goes to sleep. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so that's it. This race is ours to win and ours to lose. We certainly can lose. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we have, I mean, things could go wrong here. Uh, Musk could say something silly on Twitter and <laughs> his enemies might seize the opportunity. And if they get influence within the government to prosecute him and SpaceX goes 
kablam and 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 bezos stays in his hot tub so he doesn't pick up the snap and 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 and, you know sure we could fail uh victory is not inevitable it has to be won uh but it's within our means and 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 look you know i i'm not anti-chinese at all i i I, i've been to china a couple times I, i like the people there um and i think they're very talented and and there's many people there of goodwill, but humanity, as humanity becomes spacefaring, the template for what the future human civilization is like as we move out to Mars and to worlds beyond will be set by the culture uh, of the people who do the settlement. Okay, the, you know, only people that have children have descendants, only countries that have children, as it were, uh, have descendants. Uh, and, you know, look, we're having this conversation in English today. And, you know, I don't have a drop of Anglo-Saxon blood in me. My folks came from Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I speak a little Russian, but not really. Uh, and uh, I speak English. Uh, I'm much more familiar with English literature than I am with Russian literature. And the ideas that are implicit in English literature, the ideas of Shakespeare, okay, these ideas of individualistic humanism, okay, uh, which, you know, United States is not identical to England in any stretch of the imagination. Um, But nevertheless, the root, that's the root from which we sprang. Okay, that's our root culture. It has shaped us. It created the matrix within which many other contributions were integrated, for sure. But look, this, you can compare the United States to Latin America, okay? You, countries that were founded by the Spain of the Inquisition, okay? So our country was founded by the England of Shakespeare, okay? Uh, the, the, the country that offered the most potential for um, individual human freedom and dignity, uh, even though it was certainly not <laughs> uh, fully developed in, in Elizabethan England, but nevertheless, it was there. Uh, and the potential was there, and it was been realized, and to a fair degree. So, you know, it's the nations that participate in the human expansion space that will put their culture stamp upon the future. And I believe that the culture of freedom should its stamp should be put on the future of humanity as we expand into interplanetary and interstellar species. Uh, so I want us to be part of it, but it's up to us. Uh, you know, uh, if you don't play the game, you don't make the rules. Like you said, it's uh, it's our race to lose, right? So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you have to go there. So, so what I want to do, because uh, you know, obviously we're getting close to uh, coming up to an hour. So I think what I'd like to do for the last, uh, a little bit of time is to kind of focus and shine some light on the Mars Society and MDRS, because I think, you know, that is a very important role to play uh, for for both, because I think, uh, I'm sure a lot of people that are on this uh, chat and call are probably, you know, they're familiar with MDRS and familiar with the Mars Society, and maybe not necessarily with everything that you do. So I wonder if you could give us a little bit of a breakdown in terms of the role that the Mars Society and in parallel MDRS, because I don't know if everybody knows that MDRS actually runs the analog stations out of uh, out of the you know the station in Utah. So kind of you know why you founded the Mars Society, its role, its mission, of how to actually push things forward from you know from from the organization perspective. Okay, well, when I published the case, first edition of the Case for Mars in 1996, it was very successful. Um, uh, we sold 100,000 copies. I got 4,000 letters. 4,000 letters. Wow. Some of them were emails. The guy won the Congressional Medal of Honor in World War II. And, and uh, you know, uh, a manager of the Metropolitan Opera and bankers in Paris and 12-year-old kids in Poland and uh, just an incredible assortment of different kinds of people. And and and, and uh, folk singers and atom bomb designers. And it was amazing, okay? And... The, 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 they asked all sorts of questions, but behind all the different questions they were asking, there was uh, one fundamental question, which was, how do we make this happen? 
That's what they were all really asking. And, you know, I looked at this and then I consulted with my friends and what the network at that time was known as the Mars Underground. Uh, people like Chris McKay and Snow, Carol Stoker, and some others. And, and I said, look, you know, if we could pull these people together, we could create a force that might actually help make it happen. Okay. Because things happen when people make them happen. Okay. So let's pull together the people to make it happen. So we called the founding convention of the Mars Society and 700 people showed up from all over the world and some of the world's leading press, New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, they're all there. Um, and the, 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 and we came out of it with an organization. We decided we'd do three things, basically. One was broad public outreach, spread the vision. Second was political work to defend the Mars programs, such as they were in, in the political sphere. Um, and the third was projects of our own, um, uh, do things in the technical realm that were not being done. And, and, uh, and the most important to those has been the building of the Mars analog research stations, the first one on Devon Island in the Arctic, and then the Mars Desert Research Station in the um, desert in Utah. Um, and at this point, uh, we've had over 250 missions to these stations involving six people each. So that's something like 1,500 people have been a member of a crew of one mission or another. Uh, we also have the rover contests in which thousands of university students are participating, building Mars rovers and competing them doing exploration tasks in the desert. Um, and the, the desert stations, of course, we, we, they're there to learn how to explore on Mars by trying it out under analogous conditions on Earth. Okay, now it's easy to quantify, to some degree anyway, the value of the projects. We've had this many crew members. Uh, we've had this many rover teams. Uh, you can, I can give you statistics. They're quite impressive. Uh, the political work. Uh, Curiosity rover mission was almost canceled uh, because it had cost overruns. And, and the guy who was the uh, deputy administrator for science wanted to cancel the mission. We jumped in. We helped save that mission. We helped save the Mars Express mission in Europe because the Germans were about to pull out. Um, and and our, our European... Uh, members help help turn that around. So sure, those are our major successes. In contrast, spreading the vision seems nebulous. But in fact, I think it's the most powerful work that we do. Okay, because nothing can stop an idea whose time has come, provided the idea has messengers that can recruit to its banners the forces necessary for its realization. And we have recruited powerful forces to this vision. We helped convince Elon Musk to make Mars his calling. Okay, that's why there is a SpaceX. Okay, and that is also why if SpaceX should fail, there'll be other SpaceXs. Okay, because we are spreading this vision and there are people with talent and capabilities who are being recruited to it. And some are in the business sphere, some are technical people, some are political people. We're gonna need all these different kinds of people, okay? And by recruiting these people to the cause, um, we help make things happen that we could not do ourselves, not remotely. No, that's awesome. And uh, actually, I have a, there's a quote that actually I have a friend of mine that used to uh, that he says often that I, it always comes up in my head is that, you know, success is never necessarily it's not defined by talent alone. You know, there's a lot of grit and there's a lot of determination that goes in and you can have all the talent of people in the world getting together, but without actually some clear focus and actually having the determination and the grit to actually make that happen, it's not going to matter, right? It's not going to go anywhere. So I'm a, a real firm believer in that. So, so coming up to the time, so I want to really, uh, you know, thank you for coming. You know, you've, you've spent an hour with us today and uh, it was fantastic. I can tell by the comments that gone on here. I mean, we've had, you know, there were hundreds of people actually that came to watch you uh, speak today. So this has been fantastic. And I want to appreciate, uh, 
show my appreciation to everybody who actually showed up today. And of course, to you, Dr. Zubin, for actually taking the time out of your day to come and actually speak with us. And, uh, you know, you're, you've been an inspiration to, to many, me included, uh, you know, and uh, I'm, you know, an aspiring communicator and an aspiring to get into uh, the space industry myself and actually get a hands on, you know, I, I like talking, I like communicating, but I also want to, you know, maybe get into something like astronomy or astrophysics someday. So, so even though I'm getting a little bit old, I'm not old enough. <laughs> so I'm going to keep, uh, you know, aspiring and inspiring as best I can. So, so, and, you know, uh, having, you know, role models and mentors like you are actually what make that possible for me. So, so yeah, so our next episode that's going to be coming up, uh, is going to be with the actual MDRS crew 245. I'm actually going to have them on the show, uh, for our next episode. I'm actually going to interview them and actually, uh, talk to them about their time actually at the Utah, Utah station. So that'll be really cool. So, uh, look forward for that. And uh, Dr. Zubin, if you want to close this out, if you have anything that you'd want to kind of finish up and, uh, and say to well, uh, everyone who's here. a couple here. of points that I want to tell people. One is our next Mars Society convention is going to be October 14th through 17th. It's going to be an international teleconvention like the last one. And uh, we're going to have a lot of great speakers. Uh, last year, over 10,000 people registered. Uh, one of the speakers was Musk. We had Administrator Brian Stein and many other people. And there's still an open call for papers out on our website. If you want to speak at this conference, send in an abstract. You send it in by filling out the online form. Okay. And uh, so you have a chance that you could be a speaker at this conference too. We're looking to have a lot of people take part in this grand discussion of the greatest adventure. Uh, that humanity has. That's amazing. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Zubin, for your time today. And uh, this was fantastic. And, uh, you know, I'd like to obviously invite you back to, I mean, this is a Mars Society uh, produced show. So hopefully you'll come back and join us for some episodes, uh, you know, as we go and talk about, you know, some more specific things and get you back on the show. Uh, sure. That would, it would be fantastic. So again, thank you very much. And I appreciate your time. And uh, Fantastic. Okay. I guess, uh, okay. so we're out everybody and I really appreciate right. your time today. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Zubrin. I know. Sometime in the next few decades, humans will leave this planet to live in another world. That means that some people in our life can be the first Martians. How about that? We're finding out a lot about how to explore Mars in our station. Over a thousand people from over 40 countries have actually participated in one crew or another. It's the grandest adventure I could possibly imagine. That is, for me, the most important reason why we should pursue the establishment of life on Mars. If we go to Mars in our time, 200 years from now, there'll be new branches of human civilization on Mars. 